on behalf of the Roja Muthi Research Library, it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Professor Thomas Trotman and all the guests. Today, Professor Trotman will be delivering a lecture on the topic, The Madras School of Orientalism, Its Past and Its Future. This lecture is organized as part of the Karthik Narayanan Endowment Lecture Series. I would like to take a couple of minutes to say a few words about the Roja Muthiya Research Library and the Karthik Narayana. The Roja Muthiya Research Library was founded in 1994 to preserve, catalog and expand the collection of Roja Muthiya, a private collector who put together one of the world's finest private libraries of Tamil publication during his lifetime. The library currently holds one of the most unique collections of Tamil imprints in South Asia. Some of the publications date from the later part of 18th century. With a collection of four lakh items, RMRL provides research material and facilities for research scholars of Tamil studies in a variety of fields spanning the humanities, social sciences and sciences. Mr. C. V. Karthik Narayanan was chairman of UCAL Products Private Limited, UCAL Auto Private Limited, Director at the UCAL Tra Travels Private Limited and an independent director at Sundaram Fastness Limited. He spearheaded Standard Motors Products of India Limited, the iconic brand in the 1980s. Mr. Narayanan served as President of the Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturers in 1980. He played a key role at the Confederation of Indian Industry. He was the member of the board of SOS Children's Village of India Chatnat Homes. He had keen interest and passion for Tamil language, literature and history. His five volumes, English translation of Kalki's Pony and Selvan, introduced to thousands a Tamil classic they had only heard of. He also translated the Madras rediscovered to Tamil, bringing Madras heritage home to a whole new audience. He was the President of Tamil Nadu State Aquatic Association and promoted swimming in a big way. Mr. Karthik Narayanan was a man of many talents and had a wide interest in music, literature, industry and travel. <coughs> now, I would like to give a brief introduction about today's speaker. Professor Thomas R. Trotman is Professor Emeritus of History and Anthropology at the University of Michigan. His field of studies are the history of ancient India, the history of anthropology, kinship system of India and the environmental history of India. Among his books are Dravidian Kinship, Aryan and British India, The Aryan Debate, India, India the Brief History of a Civilization, Artha Shastra, The Science of Wealth and the last one, The Elephants and Kings and environmental history. Now, may I invite Professor Trotman to deliver his lecture. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I have to say, I have to say thank you to the Higde Foundation who brought me to India uh, to give a lecture in Baroda in honor of KTM Hickey, uh, an archaeologist. So thanks to them, I am here. Uh, also, let me just explain that the uh, nature of this paper tonight is a uh, first draft of an article I wanted to write uh, ten years ago, I published a collection of articles uh, by various scholars called the Madras School of Orientalism. And I thought uh, now, ten years later, it would be a good time to write an article that brings together uh, the subsequent works of, the, of literature, of scholarship that have appeared since that book. So you're, I, I'm sure I don't know everything that has appeared relevant to this idea, and I'm sure you will give me more material for the article I will finally publish. So uh, please do uh, give me your uh, best 
advice and suggestions. So the Madras School of Orientalism, I believe that in the early 19th century, uh, Madras was a place where uh, a really important, a really important intellectual center of new ideas about India's history and culture it, uh, uh, appeared, uh, coming out of colonial Madras and coming out of connections between Englishmen and Indians who, under the colonial dispensation, were uh, uh, entering into exchanges, including intellectual exchanges, okay? And it's that intellectual exchange that's so interesting to me. Uh, <clears throat> now, what is this title, the Madras School of Orientalism? Uh, oh, by the way, the Dravidian proof was, to my idea, the most important of these outcomes between uh, European ideas and Indian ideas. Really, the proof that Dravidian uh, was a self-contained linguist uh, language family uh, whose, uh, whose members, uh, uh, such as Tamil and Telugu, had many, many Sanskrit words in them, but these were borrowings and the indigenous words were traceable to a distinct stock of roots in Tamil and Telugu, which were essentially a single stock of roots. And that uh, the, uh, the Sanskrit borrowings were uh, in the nature of uh, tatsamas and tatsabas, uh, tatbavas. Uh, uh, that is to say, uh, Madras, because it had juxtaposed both Telugu and Tamil speakers, and also uh, knowers of Sanskrit, had the three minimum ingredients to create a conception of the, uh, of the Dravidian family as a distinct family. And that is the, uh, comes about through the comparison of the three. Uh, I won't linger over the Dravidian proof, but only to say that the first published proof came out of Madras in 1816 uh, in the writings of uh, F.W. Ellis, who was the collector of Madras and the creator of the College of Fort St. George, and a, a good Tamil scholar, very good Tamil, Telugu, and Sanskrit scholar having a circle of uh, uh, fine uh, Indian scholars uh, through which the, the historical approach to language connections of the British, the European notion of languages falling in a genealogy or a family tree uh, of connectivity, uh, joined with the structural analysis that is to be found in Tokapia and in Panini. Uh, so the, the joining together of these two traditions produces as one of its first outcomes the Dravidian idea, and this is an idea which is without precedent. It's new both to Europeans and to Indians. Uh, it's new knowledge that comes about through this exchange. That's what interested me about Madras. Now, uh, what is the Madras School of Orientalism? Well, here I've already told you that Madras is a meeting place of these kinds of scholarship that are coming together in the College of Fort St. George and other institutions. Uh, in what sense is and Madras is producing ideas that are somewhat different from and critical of the new ideas coming out of Calcutta and the Asiatic society there, and is asserting its own, Madras is asserting its own uh, command over knowledge of South India and is being a critic, a friendly critic, of some of the new ideas of history and, and culture coming out of Calcutta. Uh, what is, so that's Madras. 
oh, why is it a school? Why is it a collective uh, project? Well, uh, let's see if I can find this slide. Here, by the way, is my old uh, cell phone uh, that has two alphabetical orders on it, as you can see. It has, you know, it has the, the, the uh, order of Devanagari and Tamil and so many other Indian scripts deriving from Brahmi and uh, the Roman script, ABC, uh, which is hopeless and, and, and is uh, arbitrary. Uh, but the Indian uh, order of alphabetical order in Indian scripts such as Tamil and, and Devanagari uh, is a rational order that has behind it a phonological analysis that is very acute and very old. And this was a tool for the discovery of the Dravidian language, for the proof, the Dravidian proof, based on a comparison of roots. We don't have phones like that anymore. Um, here are a few, I, I, I'll rush through this preliminary part. Here are a few differences between outcomes uh, of this new knowledge in Calcutta and in Madras. Um, now, the Madras uh, school of Orientalism was a school in the sense of a collective uh, set of ideas, and the collectivity was formed at three basic institutions. One was uh, the Mackenzie Collection of uh, ge Geography and History, uh, formed by Cullen Mackenzie, the surveyor, and his uh, Indian assistants. These assistants were uh, not mere uh, 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 mere servants. They were themselves uh, really able scholars that came out of the out of the governments of uh, native uh, uh, princes, uh, whose uh, finances were were closing down. Uh, who were, these were, in, in the case of the uh, Telugu speakers, were uh, Laukika Brahmins who had worked for the king, who knew scripts, who knew languages, who uh, translated uh, correspondence and so forth. These were very learned men and they suddenly became uh, in need of employment and available for the Mackenzie Project, which created the basic chronology of South Indian history out of inscriptions and their dates. Uh, uh, Ellis and the College of Fort St. George uh, was created by the government to train arriving civil servants, English boys basically, to teach them Tamil, Telugu, uh, Kannada and so forth from by Indian teachers. But above these Indian teachers were very illustrious scholars uh, who were profound students of, of, of language, of grammar, of Vyakarana, and so forth, uh, and who were uh, associates of Ellis and, and interlocutors with him. Uh, Mark Wilkes uh, wrote the first history of South India, and he drew freely upon the new materials collected by Mackenzie and his associates and Ellis at the college. So, Madras School of Orientalism. What is Orientalism? Well, in my view, it is the new knowledge coming out of the study of Indian languages and landscape and inscriptions. Uh, and it is uh, combining uh, the conceptual tools of both parties in to create new and uh, uh, unprecedented knowledges, as I've said. Let's see what else we've got here. Here are two books on the Madras School of Orientalism. The first is my own study on the Dravidian proof. Uh, and it, when writing that, I realized there was so much more that I it needed really a collaboration of many, many scholars with special knowledge I, I lacked. And so I had a conference in 2007 resulting in this 
second book in 2009, uh, produced uh, by Oxford University Press in Delhi. Uh, and at the bottom of the list is the list of the contributors uh, to this uh, volume uh, that appeared as a result of that conference. And that's what I want to assess today, what happened after that. So <laughs> that's the conference poster. Uh, and here's what I'm going to talk about. After the MSO book, current MSO-related products, and here I'm going to tell you things you've never heard before. This is going to be breaking news, and future projects is going to be my wish list, what I want you to uh, uh, research about, if you would be so kind. So uh, that's the plan for this talk. Um, so after the MSO book, uh, very briefly, Padaya uh, wrote a wonderful uh, review of our book, and it's well worth reading. It's, it's produced from the point of view of archaeology, very fine review. Um, there are a whole slew of books written by the contributors to the MSO book, and these books uh, were not inspired by the conference. They were already in process when the conference started. In a sense, the conference just in, devises a name to, to put a word to what it is they had in common. And um, so these are, are related works, and I hope to fill this out uh, in the article I will eventually write. Uh, but this is a sampling of them, and I will hurry right along and not discuss these wonderful, wonderful books, but you should read every one of them because they're very good. Oop. What did I do? Um, but uh, I will hurry on to talk about two books, one by uh, Venkateswarlu and another by uh, Marudanayam. Uh, Venkateswaram uh, uh, was a professor of uh, political science at, uh, in Andhra, at uh, Andhra University in Vishakhapatnam, uh, an expert on uh, the civil service, but very interested in the language question and very uh, believing very strongly that um, uh, that Telugu was specifically very important in the emergence of the Dravidian proof. And I, we bumped into each other in the archives, in uh, uh, the Madras archives in Egmore in 2003, and we're very happy to find out we were doing much the same thing. He wrote a, a, a lovely book with a lovely cover. Uh, again, I can't uh, go into details, but what's so good about this book for me is that he talks about the Indian scholars who were involved in this process in great depth, all of them Telugu uh, speak, uh, speakers and deep students of uh, Telugu language history, uh, Mamadi Venkaya, uh, Vedam Patabhirama Shastri at the College of Fort St. George, um, uh, and many others. Uh, the writing is very good. He especially notes that Venkat Rao at the University of Madras uh, had reissued uh, uh, Ellis's Dravidian proof, the dissertation on the Telugu language as long ago as 1953. So um, uh, that's important to keep in mind. Mar uh, Nayagram uh, wrote a book uh, called Ellis's Translations from Tamil. This really comes from this fact that uh, many of Ellis's papers were rescued from oblivion. They were in the rubbish back rooms of the college and rescued by uh, Walter Elliott, and they ended up in the British Museum and uh, some of them in the Bodleian Library in England. Um, and uh, Marudha Nayagam uh, tr translates some of these verses uh, from 
his Tamo, uh, his uh, Ellis's uh, treatise on Tamo prosody or metrics. Um, this is the uh, this is uh, the cover of this book. Um, Maradonaigam believes this is a portrait of Ellis. I actually don't believe it because he has a tie like this one, a kind of long tie that I'm pretty sure wasn't invented till the 20th century. I don't think any English. So uh, we have a difference about this picture. <laughs> now, now, here is something from the past. Here is a picture of some illustrious people in this room. Uh, uh, Goku, uh, there, and Mr. Narasaya, distinguished a uh, uh, scholar here at the uh, at the Cherimalai Nayak Mu Mahal Museum in, in Madurai. Uh, we owe it that inscription in the middle uh, in, inscribed upon stone, a stone slab, was written in Tamil by Ellis. It's a kind of makirti, a kind of uh, it even includes a kind of praise of the current ruler, who happens to be George the Fourth, um, and Narsaya rescued this from oblivion by discovering it outside the museum, lying face down in the soil. So we thank him for that, and he uh, <laughs> absolutely. This is important, and and Gupu. Uh, put this in his website. He, he gives a translation of the Mekirti, which is very amusing because it uh, it uh, describes uh, King George as the triple count crown king or the the thrice crowned king, uh, a kind of allusion to ancient Tamil uh, Mekirtis, but referring to the English king claiming to be ruler of England, Scotland, and. Uh, Ireland. Uh, in this inscription, there's an obscure expression, Yuvelayat, and it is uh, Narsima who discovers that this is the name of the governor of Madras, Hugh Elliot. So let's give a <laughs> very brilliant. One, well done. So those are a few examples of uh, uh, results in the, in, in the recent past since the coming of that uh, book. Now, now I'm going to tell you things that you certainly do not know about, current projects. And there are three of them that, I'm, that I know about. One is the Tamil treatise on cowpox uh, of Ellis. Uh, the original was written in Tamil. And the discoverer is in France, Eman uh, Manu Emmanuel. He calls himself Manu. His name is Emmanuel Francis, a, a, ta a Tamilian in the French uh, library system. And uh, Sufan Ng, or however she pronounced her name, is a Chinese uh, uh, Malaysian scholar uh, who discovered uh, papers of Mark Wilkes in England, in Oxford, in All Souls College Library. And uh, Shibi Lakshman uh, is from this city, a student of Chalapati, is he here tonight? He is, over there. He is uh, uh, launching on a PhD thesis on the history of the college. So his work is underway and will be very important. Let me tell you about each of these three. Uh, well, let's back up. Start with Manu Francis. In my uh, first book, I I found uh, I found two copies of the Ellis English translation of his own Legend of the Cowpox, as it's called. What is the Legend of the Cowpox? It is written in Tamil a colloquy between Shakti and Dhanvantari about the new smallpox vaccination. Now you may remember that Edward Jenner discovered that in England 
uh, milkmaids uh, did not catch smallpox because they were uh, in contact with cowpox, a uh, something that attacked the udders of cows, and that gave them a kind of immunity. Now, at the time, the British uh, government was trying to inoculate everyone in India with this new smallpox uh, vaccine made out of the cowpox uh, 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 material. And we're trying to compose treatises or propaganda pieces in, native, in Indian languages to promote this. Ellis created such a thing, and it was in the form, as I described, as a kind of Purana, a kind of uh, uh, colloquy between the goddess and the, and the uh, physician of the gods, the Mbantari, in which they discuss this new uh, 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 vaccine, but Ellis had the clever idea of calling this boon, this new boon of the goddess, a, a sixth gavya, a sixth holy product of the cow, a given as a benefit to mankind. And it was a benefit of, to mankind because the, god, the goddess in her anger had cursed mankind to have smallpox. She then, out of compassion, mitigated the, the, the curse by imposing a limit to it, an anta. And this limit took the form of the sixth gavya, the sixth product of the cow. Now, Manu Francis found the original, I'm sorry, it's hard to read, found the, an original manuscript copy of Ellis's Tamil a uh, thing, uh, 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 treatise on the cowpox, which is called the sixth vara, the sixth boon, uh, 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 you know, illumination of the sixth great boon, the, the gavya, the sixth gavya, and uh, of the goddess. And uh, here are some, here's one of the pages of that manuscript he found. Uh, and he's published an article in French on that uh, a short uh, discussion of that, but I'm encouraging him to put the whole darn thing online, and uh, he uh, means to do so uh, soon. Let's see. Huh. And let me go back to this list. So that's one. There, uh, Manu Francis has already published a kind of announcement that's online, and I can help you find that if you want to. Uh, but he's uh, working on the fuller publication, and it's really quite exciting to see that. Uh, it, it, somehow, the French, uh, one of the French libraries happened to buy a collection of manuscripts from South India and Ceylon, and in it was this Tamil composition by Francis F. F. W. Ellis on the smallpox vaccine. An amazing thing. Second is also amazing. Su Fang Eng has written an article, has found private papers, historical papers of Wilkes leading into his hugely important history of South India, the first English language history of the deeper past of South India in All Souls College in Oxford. Now that means it's a college library. It's not the Bodleian Library of the whole university. So it's a little more obscure. Uh, she found not only all of these papers, research papers leading uh, that uh, upon which this important volume was based, but she also found work of Lakshmaya, who was one of the Telugu scholars working for Mackenzie and especially more than 100 folios of this, uh, uh, this collection are concerned with the chronology of South Indian history as constructed out of inscriptions from South India by the likes of Lakshmaya and his <coughs> brothers, and of course the 
the College of Fort St. George scholars as well, to some extent. So here is an example of this, and completely unknown. How is it that I know about this completely unknown article that hasn't been published yet and that you've never heard about? Because I was asked to be a publisher's reader for the English Historical Review. And um, I sort of divined who the author was and got her permission to talk to you tonight about this. Uh, even though it hasn't yet appeared in print. So if you uh, can uh, go online and get access to this, it'll be published sometime this summer, certainly by the fall. This is the most exciting uh, thing. Uh, finally, Shibi Lakshman. Uh, he has completed a PhD, an M M Phil dissertation, I should say, at JNU on the college history, and he's going to go into this more deeply for PhD thesis. Um, uh, this is going to be very, very, uh, a very, very great advance in our knowledge about the college side of this, uh, of this intellectual formation here in Madras itself. Um, and uh, so that's, that's going to be a wonderful addition, and we're looking forward to him completing that. Uh, he's only beginning, so we'll have to be a little patient, but uh, he's right here in Madras, so you can talk to him if you like. Um, okay, so that's, that's uh, forthcoming things that are on the horizon, in process. Now let me talk about uh, future projects. And this really is my wish list. This is what I I always hoped when we formed this conference and the conference volume that it would stimulate people like yourselves uh, uh, going out and, and filling out the picture, uh, following leads, using knowledge that I don't have and others don't have to, to expand the picture of the uh, Madras School of Orientalism. So here's my wish list. First of all, the Ellis letters. Actually, this wish list, this number one item, is my own responsibility, really. Um, I, I haven't told you the sad part of the story of Ellis. Ellis had a very high uh, standard uh, for his own scholarship, such that he resolved not to publish until he reached the ripe age of 40. Now, to me, 40 seems a little young, actually. But I wish he hadn't uh, taken that vow, because by a sheer accident, he died at age 41. Uh, and the accident was that he had some kind of chronic stomach troubles, dyspepsia, he called it, and he took actually medical leave uh, and spent some time in Madurai um, taking rest and trying to recuperate from this chronic problem he had. Uh, and he was medicating himself when he reached for the wrong bottle and accidentally poisoned himself and died slowly uh, after three or four hours of agony, during which he wrote a will and uh, you know made provision for the settling of his estate. But basically, he was uh, you know he was unmarried. He had no family. He died. It, with, uh, uh, and and there was no one from the family to uh, serve the purpose, so the uh, court uh, appointed a appointed a executor, and his books were sold, his manuscripts were sold. Uh, there's an inventory of his household goods that I found in the you know in the settlement report of this this um, uh, court appointed trustee, uh, and alas, 
It was rumored that his papers were sold uh, to one of the grandees of the East India Company, uh, Petrie, and he gave them to his cook. And his cook used Ellis's private papers day by day to kindle fires and singe chickens. <laughs> so this wonderful archive that should have ended up in the RMRL, you know, uh, ended up in smoke and we don't have it. But luckily, Ellis uh, had two friends uh, to whom he sent papers of his uh, and uh, long letters about details of scholarship that he was working on. These two friends, one of them at Bombay, Erskine, a Scotsman, and the other at uh, Calcutta, John Layden, and in the British Library and in the Edinburgh Library, uh, there are, there are uh, letters from Ellis to his friends. And of course, including that English translation of the cowpox legend that I've talked about before, and which I published in my book, hoping that the original would be found and has been now found. So, there are letters of Ellis, and I've collected what I could find and transcribed them, and they're in my computer. And uh, they should be made available uh, generally. So that's my project. Uh, college manuscripts. Uh, the College of Fort St. George sent out uh, pundits to collect manuscripts to the north and to the south. That means Telugu country, Tamil country. Uh, and the college had a manuscript collection. Uh, it, when the college was wound up in 1854, these manuscripts went into a godown and remained there a while. And then what happened to them? We don't really know directly, but my guess is they almost certainly are in the Government Oriental Manuscripts <coughs> Library. The trouble is that the uh, catalogs of that very important library talk about it acquiring manuscripts from the Mackenzie collection, but that's all they say. They say nothing about the college. Now, Venkateswaru, who worked in that GOML library, has verified, he says, that some of the Telugu manuscripts there are ones that the college had collected and not Mackenzie. Uh, but we have, no one has done this on the Tamil site, so we have the possibility of identifying, of reconstructing the contents of the college collection through the GOML. And I hope someone will take up that project at some point. Um, the third one, Indian intellectuals of the MSO and their writing, this is in some ways even more important than the intellectual product of this interaction is the creation of new kinds of careers, uh, new ways of being an intellectual in, in the 19th century by the pioneers of those new ways who were the, the pundits and the assistants and so forth, uh, Lakshmaya, Boraya, uh, Shankaraya, uh, uh, Patabhirama Shastri and so forth, the people connected with uh, Ellis or with uh, Mackenzie. Uh, uh, much to be known, I was delighted to find in a Sanskrit text about Madras intellectuals called the Sarva Deva Vilasam, 19th century text, that Shankaraya, one of these intellectuals, was briefly mentioned as a leading, you know, Shastri, a leading intellectual light of early 19th century Madras. So if we look around, we can find much more about these people who are such an important social class and in the formation of new ideas about the 
about the uh, literature and the history of the South. Um, Ellis on Tamil prosody, uh, prosody being the metrical forms of Tamil poetry. Uh, Ellis wrote a treatise on Tamil poetry metrics, prosody, and two copies of the manuscript he wrote uh, were rescued by Walter Elliott and end up in the British Library. They are there today. And um, uh, so I mention this because I think, uh, let's see if I can find this. Um, here is a quote from his friend uh, Erskine. After Ellis' death, Erskine said this in a short biography. He was an excellent classical scholar, meaning Greek and Latin. His ideas on the accent and prosody of the ancient languages, Greek and Latin, derived from his study of Sanskrit and so forth. They seem to me new and ingenious. So from that one sentence, we get the idea that Ellis had some theory about Greek and Latin metrics or prosody that derive from his understanding of Tamil prosody. So there's some bigger idea here, and I have no idea what that was, and I have no competence to go into this question. Uh, but luckily, uh, Shibi Lakshman has told me that uh, Alham Maruhan of JNU is doing exactly a thesis on Tamil prosody and will include the, these Ellis texts in his study, if I understood that right. So, if we're all patient and if God gives us long life, we will see that part of the wish list uh, fulfilled, which is very exciting, very exciting. Um, and then uh, South Indian inscriptions. Ellis collected a few inscriptions and copper plates or something, uh, and so did Mackenzie. And again, the question arises, where did they end up? Well, where would they end up? But the Madras Museum would be my first guess. And someone needs to dig very hard, but there is, uh, there are inscriptions there, and there is an archive there. And someone with a great deal of patience and um, persistence uh, could reconstruct those collections so we would know what were the historical materials exactly with which uh, the these two big projects in Madras, the side-by-side -side friendly projects and their leaders, uh, you know, what were they looking at? So that to me is very important. I also understand from Shabi that one uh, Gunasekaran at JNU is working on the vernacular histories of Tamil Nadu in the Mackenzie collection. So that's another news to me, very pleasing news about further work on the Madras School of Orientalism that is underway. I think I missed something here. Whoops. Um, what I didn't put on the, somehow got, fell off the bottom. Uh, Madras Journal of Literature and Science, uh, formed in 1812 with Ellis, in Ellis' lifetime with his active participation. Uh, it was inaugurated really the same year as the college. Uh, Ramaswamy's history of the, um, Madras Literary Society says that the early issues of the journal are lost. Uh, the earliest surviving one being the fifth volume of 1837. Anything that we could do to reconstruct those lost volumes, meaning the content of them and the authors of the pieces, what were the names of the pieces, what, who were the authors, what were they concerned about, even if we can't recover the, the actual papers would be wonderful. And we might be lucky 
uh, to find some of these papers as off prints among uh, the papers probably in the British Library of the, uh, uh, at least of the European uh, scholars uh, connected with the Madras Journal. So the, this is my wish list and I hope uh, you'll help me do this. Uh, final thoughts and I'll, with this I'll close and, and take your comments and questions. Uh, for some years I've been writing books about Orientalism and response to the uh, big book of Edward Said called Orientalism. Uh, I've been at pains to acknowledge the power, unequal power relations of which Edward Said makes so much that we mustn't bracket out the fact that there was a politics behind Orientalism that put the British on top and the Indians below them. But acknowledging that, we still have to say that even though unequal, the intellectual relations between Englishmen and Indians in colonial Madras was an intellectual relation and it did involve bringing to that relation conceptions from both sides. As for example, in the Dravidian proof, from the European side comes the decision to treat Sanskrit or any other language as a, historic, as a product of history, not as an eternal and changing thing uh, that, that is timeless, that, that lacks a history. So eternal Sanskrit goes out the window and Englishmen educated in universities in Europe in Greek and Latin come to India and discover, wait, Sanskrit sounds like Latin and Greek, you know, it has a lot of similarities and that's the beginning of the Indo-European conception of Sir William Jones at Calcutta. One that's very important and that persists to this day. So uh, I particularly object to Edward Said's formulation when he treats Orientalism merely as a European invention to dominate India. It's a kind of virgin birth of knowledge without the any inputs from the Indians themselves. It sort of just treats it as a kind of bag of bag of bad faith uh, ideas for perpetuating power. Uh, it leaves the Indian people out of it, and I want to argue to the contrary, though in e unequal, the relations over ideas of history, language, and so forth were ones in which analytical techniques of both sides entered into it. The European idea of historical process and historical attitude towards language and so forth combines with the structural analysis of the copium and, and uh, anony uh, and the analytical categories uh, that were generated for analysis by those uh, Indian traditions that are very ancient and very present and actually got sort of folded into modern historical linguistics, international historical linguistics and are of at use, to, use today. In no country in the world has the research program of Orientalism in Said's sense been more heavily applied than India. And India has suffered from it. The colonial studies model displaces Indians as the subjects of Indian history, replacing them with their colonial European rulers. That's why I like the Dravidian proof as the best counterexample of that. Uh, Indian contributions have been recognized fully, most fully, by the English phoneticians, such as W.S. Allen in his book, Phonetics in Ancient India. Uh, he fully recognizes the, the substantive and analytic contributions of the Indian tradition in grammar. 
and he's a figure somewhat uh, in the line of succession to Henry Sweet, who in turn you have all met if you have heard the play by Bernard Shaw called Pygmalion, or if you've gone to the movie called, remind me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> My fair lady, Henry Higgins. That's, that's, that's the one. <laughs> uh, so, um, alas, um, uh, with the worldwide growth of hypernationalism, analysis is moving further in the wrong direction, in my view, towards sharply opposing identity formations. Uh, here is English thought or European thought. Here is Indian thought or European thought. There's no overlap. They belong in separate boxes, and the one imposes on the other. It's a hideously simplified model. Uh, and one which is uh, becoming more and more popular, unfortunately. So this is what I so like about, for example, Shibi Lakshman's uh, thesis and what it says about the college, which locally was called the Chennai Kalvi Sangam. The College of Fort St. George was called the Chennai Kalvi Sangam. You know, with this... G -G uh, its gesture toward the deep past in that word Sangam. Uh, it's a new fo formation, but it signaled its cultural continuity from the deep past uh, and with a, with a long past, but also its newness. Well, those are some of the ideas that have made me think I should write this article and publish it somewhere and hope to engage you here tonight uh, in, uh, in uh, telling me other things I should put into it. So thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>